Welcome back to the Football Fitness Federation podcast. I am delighted today to be joined by Professor and High Performance Consultant JB Marin. JB, thank you very much for coming on. Hi, thank you for inviting. I've got to say that every time we put out um, when we ask for recommendations of guests on the podcast, your name is always towards the top. So I really do appreciate you coming on and I'm sure many people will um, be listening with intent in terms of what you have to say on the podcast. Excellent. Thanks. That's great. I appreciate that. So, I, yeah, and I just want to thank you as well because a lot of your research has obviously guided a lot of people's way of working and their coaching practice. And I mean, I, I, when I was preparing for the podcast and going through some of your work, I mean, there's, there's so much work out there that you've put out there. So I just, just as part from the industry in a way, thank you for all the work that you do, you have done and you are currently doing. Thanks. I, I think we should also thank all my teammates and young collaborators because many of them are um, actually from football and um and 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 we we care about that so i think that's part of it yeah definitely no that's great and a, a lot of our listeners will know um about your work and i'm sure they would have read an, an aspect of your work before but do you want to just give us a little bit of background jb on on um your career um but also yeah. where you came from you just mentioned off air about your playing career as well so if we go through that and then take us up to into your some some your research Yeah, so basically, um, I was a, a typical French kid uh, playing football until until 1890s. Um, I was a goalie, but I, I usually uh, enjoyed also playing uh, 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 on the pitch as well. And so then I, I stopped football for a while because of studies and so on. And then I always play from time to time now with my kids. Uh, but... Um, I'm a sports science uh, student. Uh, I did a master's in training, in sports training. Then I passed a PhD in locomotion biomechanics. So basically that connected the, I want to know more about sports performance to the, this is how the human functions. And basically, I think it's, it's a good summary of my, of my research. It's like, okay, you want to know more for X reasons, uh, coach better, improve performance, prevent better, rehab better, fine. Your job is also to know how the, work, uh, how the body works, and, and that's, that's physiology and biomechanics. So that was kind of using one to, answers, uh, to answer questions in the other field. So, because if you want to know more about football by just studying football, I think it's at some point you will be limited. So you will have to bring some external field of research, like, for example, biomechanics into play. So is it safe to say that you're um, previously playing the game that inspired like your research now? Is that the reason why you went into what you're into now? It's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question because the answer is no. <laughs> And I will tell you why, because what, what actually triggered my, my will to know more about research was actually sprinting. Because uh, story short, I, I stopped playing football because in France back in the days, they were either green grass fields for the high level and I was playing until uh, 18 at that level or some sand pitches yeah that existed salmon sand pitches for the lowest level and then I was a goalkeeper and the, the year we went down and I had to play there I did two training sessions and I said over I'm going to run and do track and field so I did track and field for a couple of years and then I started asking questions about how can we accelerate more? How can we sprint better as an athlete then? And so that triggered my sports science uh, uh, passion. But of course, now it goes back to soccer as well because, because we also sprint in football, right? Definitely. And I think that's where possibly a lot of people would have seen your work or heard of your work before is the Um, the work you've done on sprint mechanics, on acceleration, and I want to dive into that in a little bit. But I was going to ask you to start with, and it's a really broad question, but I wanted to just get your opinion on it. What do you think, um, what's your views on, on the level of physical performance in football? How do you think we're rating with other sports? I don't know. It's, it's complicated to answer that because, um, because football is one of the originalities of football is that it's, uh, let's say, compared to many other sports, it's a 
half body uh, uh, imbalanced sport. It means you use a lot more, only your lower body, well, expect the goalies, okay? But goalies not football, right? <laughs> I can say that. <laughs> uh, but you use much more the only lower body than in many other sports where you both run and hit and throw. So that's for one. And the other thing I, I, I think is that there's a lot of um, uncertainty in the movements because of the ball handling and because we shouldn't say ball handling in football because technically speaking, it's, it's not handling the ball, all right? So um, for that reason, football is very specific. So I think in terms of, if you compare to other team sports, I would say in terms of um, uh, physiological capacities, aerobic capacity and so on, I think it's, it's more or less within the same uh, ballpark. But the, the thing that's really, really impressive in football compared to other sports is the, the technical skills of operating on one foot and, and moving the body re, with re, very short you know, contact and, 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 and action. So I would say that um, I, I play a lot of sports and every time I stop playing football for a while and I go back to it, that's the sport that gives me the highest doms muscle damage at the ankle, foot and knee. Uncomparable with, I don't know, uh, uh, tennis, swimming or whatever. So that's the particularity. That's a really an interesting uh, point of view because I fully agree with that. I think that's, uh, I think you definitely feel that getting towards the late 30s and, and 40s. I, I think when people dive back into football, then they'll fully appreciate what you just said there in terms of the, the dumb side of it. And that shows the impact, doesn't it, of the game? Yeah, sure. And then, JB, in terms of some of your work, so I, I put out, I reached out to a few friends of ours in terms of practitioners um, that are working in the game to see what they would want you to talk about. And one thing that came up was heavy sled training. And I think it's safe to say a few years ago that not, if we go back quite a few years, there wasn't many people doing this. And I think for me, you were one of the first people that I saw releasing research on this area. Um, yeah. So can you just talk through some of the, the potential um, results of in, implementing sled training? Yeah, so historically speaking, in other sports, so let's, let's get comparisons where they should be, okay? Rugby, uh, NFL. So other sports traditionally used that kind of um, input a lot for improving acceleration performance. So the first thing is, it makes sense in many other sports, why not in football? Okay, so that's the first reason. Then the second thing that happened is that we saw the literature and yes, there was not any study. And so these two reasons, nobody does, and there's no science on it for us, was not good arguments to keep on not using that stimulus. So we don't think, we don't think it's the magic stick and, and, and everybody was stupid not using it. We just say the stimulus makes sense for reasons I will explain after that. And the reasons for not using it don't, okay? Because most of the time when we first discussed with some coaches, that was some answers. Uh, we don't because nobody does, which is in my opinion, something really, wow. Um, we don't because there's no science on it. So uh, there's no evidence it's useful. Damn, yeah, but you know, <laughs> there's no evidence it's not. And we don't because we are afraid of players getting injured. And then for the, for the chapter of players getting injured, I'm going to close that chapter very quickly because some coaches told me that. And at the very same time, the same guys were doing some full squats at the gym with the players. So mechanically speaking, I, I, to me, there's a huge gap. And so the reason was, and then I said, yeah, but guys, there's no evidence that they were going to be injured. <laughs> so just reversing the thinking there. So then we saw the literature and what really triggered the studies was one of my master students. He came one day, he was a football coach. Okay. So he was in football and he said, prof, look, I don't have a gym. I don't have time to develop the strength of the players, the non-specific strength of the players. So I cannot bring that input and I don't have enough time. Even if I had a gym, I don't have enough time to transfer that strength to the game, to their physical capabilities. So 
I think heavy sleds could be a combo because it's heavy enough to be an overload for the muscle system, obviously. And it's heavy enough to be also a very good sprint acceleration overload. Because if you think about that, if you want to overload a function to improve it, then you have to bring... So if you want to overload my, my pulmonary system and my cardiovascular system by putting me at altitude, it's because your objective is that when I will be at sea level, I will perform better. Okay, so we should see heavy sleds as a overload stimulus. And then we decided to do some studies, and I think people should be very, very careful with that. We didn't take the amateur players and from one day to another, put them on two times five heavy sled sprints a week for eight weeks. We built that very progressively, and after two months, they were ready enough to pull some sleds like they do anything else. And this is the key. Uh, I understand there's a risk of injury if some players have never done resisted sprints and boom, you do a, a, a block of training. Of course, they will get injured. I always use that. If you drink five liters of water, then water will kill you. It's not because of, the, it's not because of water itself. It's just because of the stupid way you handle that. Okay? So to me, it's just another tool in the toolbox and some of our results and we are confirming that, showed that if it's well done, if it's progressively included into the global scheme of training, it's useful, not for every player, but for those who lack big acceleration capabilities. And then if you read the net, and if you listen to some coaches in other sports, even very high level football, US football players got benefits from using resistances. So I think it's a it's, it's a good stimulus, and I think it's been accused of many, many things for, for wrong reasons. It's very fun. People tend to say, I don't do that when there's no evidence. And when you say, why not doing that? They say, whoa, because there's no evidence. I mean, you know, intellectually speaking, it's, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, so, you, so you need evidence sometimes and sometimes not, and it's like, it's like you prefer just for your confirmation bias. Yeah. So no. now... Some teams use it, and uh, there's going to be some work by, uh, by a student I, I supervise, Johan Lati, in football players using heavy sleds and checking both the improvement in performance, which is very, very much centered on the early acceleration. You will very likely not improve your top speed using heavy sleds. And the associated changes in kinematics, because that was also another reason. It will destroy their running pattern, and, and obviously it's not the case. And that's something I was going to ask in terms of considerations that coaches need to make when, co when coaching a heavy sled sprint. So what are some key considerations that they need to be cueing in terms of technique? Yeah, very interesting. So I love, the, I love what you said, coaching a sprint-resisted sled. It's something that you need to coach. It's not just put the loads and ask the guys to pull. That's, that's really poor coaching. So yes, you need to see the athletes, to cue everything. So we are in the situation where you have been through eight, 10 weeks of familiarization, okay? What you should coach and cue is, in my opinion, three things. The overall orientation of the push, you need your athletes to, you know, and that's why heavy sleds are interesting. It's just because it allows your body going more forward. You can never do that with a, heavy, with a light sled because with a light sled, you cannot bend forward. So feeling that forward push first. Second is feeling that long push into the ground because that's where you feel your body just applying that force onto the ground. When you run fast, you don't have that connection to the ground. And the final thing is the, the ankle stiffness because that's the most underestimated variable in, in sled training. And that's something we are going to investigate. It's the ankle stiffness. If uh, I tweeted that video one day, if you don't have a good foot and ankle stiffness, when you pull heavy, that's gonna, that's gonna be the only thing you see. You cannot see that if the contact time is short and if, okay, so, but that being said, be very careful. Yes, when you use heavy sleds, you will run slower, 
your contact time will be longer and your push will be uh, of a longer duration. That's exactly what we want because that's what we want to coach. So there's an analogy because people think that because you train like that, you're going to become like that. You're going to become slower with a longer contact time. That's absolutely, and as a, it's the same. It's, it's a wrong thinking. Uh, it's exactly the same as saying, if I go at altitude to train, I produce less power on my bike. But why do I go to altitude? It's to produce more power when my body will be adapted. After that, it's the effect. That's what we are looking for. I think that's a great analogy and, and really makes sense. Um, just on something you said before, where you touched on um, using heavy, heavy sleds, but not necessarily with every player. So would that depend on position or would that depend on, what would it depend on? Um, position, I don't, I don't have enough information so far to, to tell you what kind of position is associated to what kind of profile. But what I know is that because heavy sleds tend to improve the left part of the force curve, which is force at low speed, the first steps, the maximum force, um, there's another study going on uh, soon published by Johan Lati showing that basically in rugby players, in rugby players, the players with a very, very force oriented profile, so the guys who are already very good at their maximum poor, uh, force output, don't benefit much from that kind of training. So it means very likely it's going to be more useful in players with a, let's say, a, a weakest acceleration potential. But it's very, very, very often the case for what I've measured in football players. Most football players compared to other sports lack that maximum acceleration. And that's what, and basically that's what's really important in the game also. That first two, three, four steps. Boom, boom, boom. Definitely. And just to, to break down, I'm sure many people are aware of this and know the answer. Um, but in terms of how it helps acceleration, because you mentioned before about it not, so much, not helping so much with top end speed um, when players are upright, but it helping with acceleration. So what's, what's the reasons behind that? It's just because it's, it's exactly the, the term of specificity of the stimulation. It helps the acceleration because it stimulates the muscular um, um, components of early acceleration, which is force at low velocity and high force output. So it means I would tend to say, for example, if you only do top speed work, it makes sense that you will observe more gains in the top speed part of the spectrum and not much in the acceleration. Again, in trained people, if I coach my young boy to run fast, that will improve his acceleration, of course. But you know, so let's talk about velocity specificity of the stimulus. And so, yes, high resistance will stimulate more the high force slash low velocity part of the profile and that's acceleration. I know very well that football is not starting from zero and accelerating, thank you. But uh, we have some crazy data now under process. And I, I, I don't want to talk more about that, but that show that at the lowest velocities and so the maximum level of acceleration in a typical football week if you get some data you see a lot of maximum acceleration so that left part of the spectrum is also very much used now i was going to ask as well in, we've touched on heavy sled training and we've talked about resistance yeah. what would you recommend in terms of what what do you mean by that how heavy so Again, the, the recommendation depends on your objectives. For example, for some players, I will recommend light loads. For some others and for some other objectives, I will recommend heavy loads. So I think the most stupid thing is to say, never do this, always do that to everybody, thank you, bye bye. The smart way to approach things is to say, okay, what do we need to develop in what player and what's the most appropriate solution? So heavy sleds for players who need acceleration, our current recommendation is to focus on 
a load that would decelerate your maximum speed by about 50%. It means if your maximum speed is 10 meters per second, or eight, let's say, eight to 10 meters per second, a heavy load in that context will be something that slows you down by four to five meters per second. So that load will depend on the surface. It will depend on the type of sled you use. So I cannot recommend any kilograms or any body mass load. I just recommend some percent of maximum velocity decrease. But in our studies so far on typical grass or uh, artificial turf using sleds, this corresponds depending on the subjects to 60 to 100% of body mass. So that's a huge, you know, so I don't recommend any type of load in body mass. I recommend the load that will slow you down significantly. Basically, if you put some load on the sled and you still run super fast, it might be very good to stimulate something else, but not the focus on, on maximum acceleration, orientation of the push on the ground and all we have discussed before. So again, uh, it's, it's a message that should be clear. Heavy sleds are not recommended for some objectives and are recommended for other objectives. And then what about some other factors when using that, that technique? So in terms of, I'm thinking about different pitches, pitch quality, um, whether it's 5G, 4G, grass, yeah. sand maybe, Super. like you mentioned before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so we, we don't have much research on that. All we know is that the surface that are in contact, so that the sled surface, if you use a sled and the, the, the pitch or the ground, play a major role in the force, in the, in the relationship between the load that you use and the force that it generates. And you all know that if you, if you do the, the same sled session on a very dry turf and on the same turf that's wet, the load will be the same, but the stimulus in terms of force will be different. It's like, I didn't tell you, but at the gym on the Smith machine, I removed two discs. It's not the same session. So that's, it plays a role. And, and a lot of people are going to relate to this question, JB, and it's something that, that came in from a previous guest, actually, on the podcast. But what, what would your approach be in a, in a football league club um, that is typically on a one game week cycle. So we're talking probably Saturday to Saturday. What yeah. would your approach be to developing sprint performance with the players? Well, that's a, that's a really uh, very large question. Very, uh, so first, developing sprint means many, many, many different things. So basically that's acceleration performance, top end speed, you know, change of direction speed, etc. But my first recommendation will be to, if you have enough, you know, technology, of course, to monitor and to be aware of the sprint dose, the sprint exposure of your players. Okay. Because that's going to be the key for programming. You, it's, in my opinion, it's crazy to give recipes to people and say, you should do that on Monday, that on Tuesday, that on Wednesday, if you don't know the exposure of the players, okay? So I totally um, think that within a team, some players should be given, even in the same game context, they should be given different regimens. So I think rule number one is to maintain a very regular exposure to maximum velocity. So be careful, not necessarily the absolute maximum velocity, like you're going all out and it's chaos, but at least to a good, well-controlled 90% maximum velocity, okay? So it means that maybe every training session, there should be within the game itself or in specific sprints, some high running speed for everybody okay not too much not too often but there should be some times in the week like that i would say my, my feeling there's no research on that and i i want some research to be out on that but my feeling is that if a typical player that's healthy spends three days in a row without a single exposure to maximum speed running 
there's an issue. In my opinion, that's an issue. It's not normal as a football player. Why isn't that normal? Just because the game on Saturday will require that, will require many sprints. And you cannot say when you start a sprint on a game, you cannot say, whoa, 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 I'm not doing this one because I need to regulate. You see what I mean? No, you just go. And if your body is used to that, I think you're going to do better and you're going to be more safe uh, rather than not doing it during the, the entire week. I mean, maybe you have some friends. I have some friends. Hopefully, I must say myself, when you do just pick up games with your, with your mates every two weeks, in terms of injury risk, that's, you know, that's, that's crazy. You pop. So that's exactly the same. It's just because you, you don't stimulate that often, but football is football. Football is going to ask you for some sprints. So you get, you, you get to be ready for that. And then in terms of using uh, resistances over the week and so on, I think the main rule would be to not use uh, resistances less than two days before the game or with a very, very light dose because, yeah, it is resistance training, okay? So it brings tissue adaptation, it brings fatigue, so you need time to uh, recover and maybe, you know, adapt. And, and in terms of the nature of a sprint or a, or a sled sprint, it, it's, um, and, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's very concentric in nature. So would that be something that could be used in terms of potentiation for a game as well? Uh, no, it's... I don't think we can we can we can be that um, assertive on the concentric or eccentric. Uh, you know, it's not like you tick and, and heavy sled is in the concentric box. When you put your foot on the ground in any type of running step, with or without a sled behind you, there's many lengthening muscle unit, muscle tendon unit lengthening everywhere. So it's not because you increase the level of mechanical energy overall because you create some speed that is concentric you see what i mean so uh, i wouldn't say that but in terms of potentiation you can consider that as any other type of uh, overload exercise in terms of potentiation and right now the literature is really not clear on the benefits of that so i think it's you have to rely on your own experience um, some players like it they want to have it before the games some players don't um, i've been in a sport where in cycling where uh, some cyclists wanted to do a session before the day before a race some other ones didn't and, and research is absolutely not clear on that so that's exactly the context we are in so sorry for that but uh unclear no no that's great and then We've got a couple of specific questions on some of your work that you've released. So I'm just going to read it. But the, the first yeah. one is, um, can you use other modalities other than a barbell jump, such as dumbbells or trap bar for jump profiling? So um, the question for trap bar has very often been asked and, and, and we've tried that. And uh, I've also seen some, some colleagues in rugby trying that because the argument is, is, is sound. Uh, there's no way I can have my rugby players jumping with, a, with a 120 kilos on the shoulders, but they can do that with the trap bar. So the answer is, is yes and no. Yes, because it works. You will end up with a linear relationship and, and with something that makes sense. And no, well, it's a partial no, but be careful. The data will be slightly different from so for the same people with the same loads the profile will be slightly different from a, a, a back squat measurements so we don't exactly know why right now but there are several groups who did that comparison and found some differences so i would say use the modality that you prefer but only compare your data to your data and not to other measuring modalities okay I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, it's, it's not out, but I've seen uh, some Canadian people presenting that at a Congress in uh, at the European College of Sports Science. It was something like two or three years ago. 
and they went through that biomechanical analysis comparing trap bar and, and, and loaded back squat and, and the paper is not out. But remember that, yes, but that's gonna be specific data. Now for the dumbbells, um, I'm a bit more skeptical for two reasons that are practical reasons. First is maybe it's difficult to reach that very heavy loads for the left part of the curve points with dumbbells first. And second, you have to make sure that the entire jump has the dumbbells kept in hands and uh, it doesn't affect the, the data. So, you know, uh, I think Trap bar is a good alternative if you want, but dumbbells is a bit more uh, difficult, practically speaking. So some people, sorry, some people also asked me for vests, loaded vests. Yeah. And the answer is about the same. Um, it's much better in terms of fitting the load to the body. That's the aim of a loaded vest, but it's, it's difficult to reach some heavy loads. And, and you know, for accuracy of that profile, you need some heavy loads to be measured. So it's, it's, you cannot have a loaded vest with 120 or something, or even 60 kilos, pretty difficult, okay? Yeah, that's one hell of a weighted vest, that one, isn't it? If we get 120 kilos on there. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> um, the next one, JB, again, another, another quite specific question is, do athletes have to go to 90 degrees to use the force, pro um, force velocity profiling spreadsheet? Uh, that's a key question. Um, at the very beginning of the approach, we said yes, uh, and we made a mistake because basically a squat jump in the Bosco definition, a squat jump has to be performed with the knees at 90 degrees. So we had to respect that, but this is a big mistake. Why? Because exactly 90 degrees has two practical consequences. The first one is that it might not be exactly my most comfortable position to push and go all out. So I might be in a length position that's not you know, good for me. And the second problem is that, and it's related, uh, it's gonna be tough to fix that, to set that accurately at the beginning of the, of the rep. So that's, the, that's where there is a huge difference between scientific theory and practice. And this is why we make our recommendations change over time. It's because we actually tried that with athletes. And what did we do? We respected the textbook and we said 90 degrees. And so some players were even not able to, to stand, okay? And it took two or three seconds to say, okay, a bit higher, a bit lower. And, and so the jump was affected. So now our recommendation is go close to 90, but in the preferred position of the player because First, they will push very hard and you're gonna have a good ballistic action, positive. And second, they will be super reliable, individually, positive. Which means, if you ask me to go four times to my starting position, I will go four times very, very close. So that's improving the measurement quality in the end. So yeah, try to be around 90 degrees, but don't, don't force 90 degrees for everybody. Brilliant. And then I know um, you sent over a recent paper that you've released in terms of some seasonal changes with um, sprint mechanics in, in yeah. players. So can you just discuss that and, and possibly give some of uh, the outcomes from that as well? Yeah, it's a, it's, it, I think it's a major paper. It's uh, by uh, Pedro Jimenez and it was done with, uh, with good level Spanish players in a professional club. So it's uh, realistic data. Basically, we, we wanted to know how the, prof, the mechanical profile in sprinting, so the maximum force output, maximum speed, change during a typical football season. Why? Because if you see no change at all, it means, well, football playing and training doesn't impact your, your, your running mechanical output, and, and that's fine. But if it changes with like a group tendency or for some individuals, then you know how to program the sprint work accordingly. So for example, we, we saw that after preseason, there's a slight change in the profile where overall with football practice in autumn and winter, things improve. Overall, it means, the, let's say, the players get fitter sprint-wise with playing football, which kind of makes sense. 
And then there's a decrease in, in, in many variables in February, let's say in, during the spring. And this is very interesting for two reasons. The first one is if you want to have your players maintain their good level of sprint power, uh, maximum velocity and everything, you know that maybe you need to stimulate that part of the season. You see what I mean? So I think the most interesting part of the paper is where should we focus on something because that quality is decreasing. So of course, there's two limitations. The first one is that it's only for that teams in that context. And you don't know if you need to apply that in your league team or in your Champions League team because you don't know if it's going to be the same. And the second thing is that there's a big, big, big variability among players. So my advice right now, and this is something we do with a pro rugby club in France, uh, is to have that monitor. This study is basically a proof of concept saying do your own profiling throughout the season and don't take our conclusions to your context, but take our methods to draw your own conclusions. I think this is the most important thing and this is something I say to coaches when I discuss with them. I say research conclusions are not a recipe that you need to stamp on your practice. It's just some ideas that need to trigger your own testing in your own context. Because if you have a different training philosophy with sprinting in your team, these results might totally not apply to your context. But at least these results should say, hey, try to check if they apply to your, to your context. You see what I mean? So. And, and this study also shows that you can test that in a real professional club scenario. It's just, it's just a sprint every two months or something. So it's no big deal. No, that's brilliant. I think, I think that, that really makes sense. And it, I think it applies to a lot of things with what we do as well, doesn't it? Is yeah. taking the research out there, but not, sure. not taking it as something that we have to implement. But what can we take from it and question it? Yeah. Um, another one, JB, in terms of future research. So... Um, sorry, I'm just going to read it again. So future research looking closer and linking step-to-step -step profiling with force velocity profiling. Uh, what, what do you mean by step-to-step? -step? Um, uh, kinematic or? I think so, yeah. Mm. So that's something that's, uh, that's interesting is uh, how can we relate the kinetic profiling because what we suggest with our method is a kinetic profiling of the player. What's your output? What does the main limitation of our approach is that we don't see you as a multi-segmental system with some, you know, we see you as a center of mass moving. That's very, very simplifying, but at least we have an idea of your system output, the macroscopic view of your system. Now we need to dig deeper into how did you do that? You know, mechanically speaking, what was the pattern? What was the foot posture? What was the trunk posture associated with that? So this is not some studies I'm going to uh, supervise directly right now, but there's some research project on that, uh, especially in the UK, where uh, coaches in particular want to connect the shapes with the macroscopic outputs. And I think this is very interesting. So now we know how to measure the macroscopic output. We know what you need. Now we want to know what your body needs to do to produce that. Because we want to link uh, the both ends of the, of the biomechanical profile. No, well, that's awesome. And, I, and you've, you've touched a lot on future research and some studies that are, that are going on currently. Um, yep. And I really appreciate you coming on because I think this, is, this has been amazing and you've answered all the questions to the top level I knew you would. But in terms of if people want to follow your work, your research, um, where's the best place to do that? Uh, I guess the best place is Twitter just because uh, it's a very convenient way for me to, to push some information that I produce with my team or that I like so that I think people need to know. Okay. So uh, I try to have that focus on Twitter and then if uh, for more scientific content, uh, there is of course ResearchGate where we publish our papers and uh, 
my website because sometimes on my website is jbmarine.net uh, because on my website you can access to some contact form to contact me and to some blog posts because from time to time when I have a, a key question in mind and I want to bring some, you know, some discussion, some data, some, some thoughts, uh, it's very easy to, to write a blog post and push that on the blog. You know, it's, it's faster, it's quicker out for discussion. But I guess everything I mentioned there is one day or another pushed on Twitter. So if you want to go to that media, that's, that's the most, uh, it's a, it's a one-stop shop, let's say. And then some of the spreadsheets and things that we've referenced in the, in yeah. the episode as well, they're all available on, yeah, on the website as well. Basically on my blog, every time we had a spreadsheet out or an update, I wrote a blog post where you can have a written tutorial, a video tutorial, and the, a link to the spreadsheet. So I think if you are educated and uh, you know how to use Excel, you can do things correctly just from the spreadsheet itself and the video tutorial. And within the spreadsheet, there's always the links to the papers if you want to go and read the, the biomechanical basis of everything. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, JB, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I'm sure Thanks. many people have took plenty away from this episode. So thank you very much. And um, we'll hopefully catch up soon. Yeah, my pleasure. Take care. Thank you. Cheers.